Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Slim, and this is Alex, and we are very excited to be showing you how Notion uses Notion. Okay, thanks, Slim. Let's get into it. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We're going to do some quick introductions just to let you know who we are and what we work on at the company. So like Slim said, I'm Alex. At Notion, I'm our social community specialist. Um, so it's not a very descriptive name. So what do I do at Notion? Uh, great question. I usually uh, explain it as features, feedback, and social. So I keep a uh, running working knowledge of all the features within Notion, and I work on our product documentation and help center. Um, I also run our social media platforms, including our Twitter. Uh, and because of that, I'm speaking with users uh, all the time. And because I speak with users, I then take all of that user sentiment and feedback and bring that back to the company. Um, how I use Notion personally, uh, I keep a running report of all of the different books that I've read and how I feel about them, um, as well as my wardrobe. So all the clothes that I own and what I wear. And I'm Slim. I am a software engineer currently on the infrastructure team, which means I spend a lot of time working on site reliability, performance, things like that. You may know me from uh, some product features that I shipped before I was working on the infrastructure team. So things like inline equations, confluence import, which you'll be hearing a little more about today. And uh, the first project I worked on was the first version of Quick Find at Notion. And how I use Notion personally, I track all of the topics that I'm currently learning and all of the Pokemon I've caught across various video games. So let's get into it. Um, to start off, here is a look at the Notion company workspace. So our top level workspace has pages for both core company-wide database concepts and also pages for individual functional teams. So global databases are useful because they allow us to work with a few consistent core concepts across teams, things like documents, tasks, meeting notes, and we'll go into a little more about those uh, in the later in this presentation. Um, but in addition, we recognize that individual teams have their own needs uh, and the need to represent information in different ways. So every core function has their own page as well, which they can then adapt as they see fit. So for example, I'm on the product and engineering team, which means that we have a page that we primarily use as a wiki for diff documenting different aspects of Notion's engineering workflow, um, how we go about product development, things like that. And Alex on the customer experience side has a subpage for their whole team um, where they're able to organize information however is most useful for them. And then of course, our cross-functional teammates on teams like marketing, uh, sales and success, the people team, finance team, all of those teams also have their own subpage as well. Um, but the most interesting part of this, I think, is these global databases that we actually do share across teams and across functions. So now we're going to walk you through some of those and deep dive into what each of these top level global databases represents, starting with docs. Yes. So this is our docs or documents database. Uh, this is really important for us at Notion because we're built on a culture of documentation. We really believe in the power of storing all of our knowledge in a top level source that everyone across the company can see. Um, like Slim said, although we have individual team pages, our docs are a workspace level database. And that means that no information is siloed uh, and that anyone from any team can deep dive into the docs database and find exactly what they're looking for. Even if, you know, for example, like I was trying to find something that the product team had created or the marketing team had created. So you can see here in this screenshot examples of several uh, different documents that we have in this database. And I'm going to highlight some different categories of docs that we use all the time. So the first is a request for comment or RFC. This is something that we generate whenever we're coming up with new product ideas, processes, um, all of that stuff. So you'll draft this and then you will put it in the docs database and then you'll share it out with the rest of the company. And this is a chance for you to solicit feedback and get um, comments like the name implies um, from everyone uh, who needs to see it. So you usually designate a mandatory comment giver or several mandatory comment givers who are key stakeholders. But of course, since the whole company has access to these documents, everyone can chip in uh, and everyone has a say in you know, what product updates we have and what processes we're generating. 
We also use our docs database uh, for company-wide announcements. Uh, you can see in here that there is a uh, COVID-19 update. And so that's one way that we've been using our docs databases every time we have an update on the general COVID-19 situation or how that impacts our work, um, how that impacts our office reopening. Uh, those are posted uh, in these in the docs uh, database and that allows it to be preserved for posterity uh, you know in case new teammates join and want to see all the different decisions that we've made or announcements that we've had in the past and finally we use docs to store processes uh, so lots of things that we do lots of workflows that we have are repeated uh, and also are not necessarily uh, performed by just one team uh, so for example, here you have uh, a document second from the bottom called how to share user feedback. Uh, that's something that almost everyone uh, at our company will use. And so we like to say like, why give someone a fish when you can teach them how to fish? Uh, and so by putting our docs in here, we ensure that things are repeatable, uh, that our teammates can jump in and uh, have a consistent process and a consistent deliverable um, when they need to reference it. So speaking of processes and deliverables, an important aspect of the company collaboration is tracking all of the tasks that are happening at any point in time. And some people are actually surprised to find that we have a single tasks database for all the teams across Notion. But this is actually a really important part of how we work and allowing us to see at a glance what other people are working on, assign collaborators from across teams to the same task, and all of the other aspects of cross-functional collaboration. So. The way we keep this manageable is to use filtered database views. If we had a single view that showed all of the tasks happening across the entire company, that wouldn't be particularly useful because it would be information overload. So fortunately, we're able to take advantage of database views to curate information depending on who needs to look at it at what point in time. So the first view that I'll show here, which I use quite frequently, is the mine view. And this shows all the tasks that are assigned to me as an individual Notion user. So here you can see that this filter is constructed um, by setting the assign property and containing the me variable. Me is a special variable you can use in these filter views, um, which refers to whoever the currently logged in Notion user is. And this avoids the need to create a separate database view for every person in your workspace, uh, which is really handy for creating customizable and reusable views. We don't just use database views for individual people though. We also use them for roles or functions. So as another example, we have a triage unassigned view, which shows all of the bugs and user issues that are currently in need of an owner. At Notion, we have a triage rotation on the engineering team where every week a different person is responsible for handling incoming user issues, categorizing them and addressing any high priority fixes. But it's really important part of the process that we're able to have an ongoing work queue that says what kinds of tickets are currently unassigned and don't have an owner across some other team. And that shows the tasks that the triage engineer can pull from. So in this view, you can see it's a little more complicated, um, but we have multiple filter groups and so the first thing we check is that tags contains triage, which says that it's an incoming ticket as opposed to a project related um, task. We also have an and group that says, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> uh, we also have an and group that says uh, the tags does not contain any particular infrastructure or product team assignee. And lastly, we set the assign field to be empty, which shows that there is not currently someone else responsible for driving that task. So put together, these filters allow whoever is currently on the triage rotation to easily track what views they should be looking at and what tasks they can pull from to be most effective in that role. And finally, our last top level database uh, uh, is for meeting notes. So while we do rely heavily on documentation um, and written uh, different feedback methods, of course, we also do have to get in front of each other and meet in person and make decisions live. And so we do have lots of meetings. And when those meetings happen, we track what happens in these uh, in the meeting notes database. So we really want to make sure that there is an open door metaphorically at the company. So even if you weren't present at a meeting, you can still go to the meeting notes database and uh, get up to speed on what happened there, why decisions were made, uh, what decisions were made, and then what follow-up items um, there were. Something that we rely on really heavily for our meeting notes um, are templates. 
So at the top right of this database, you can see that there is a new button. And next to that, there's a little drop down carrot. That's where you can configure templates for this database. And that makes sure that uh, these meetings, especially meetings that are recurring, like weekly um, all hands or weekly team meetings, uh, they stay on track and you're not trying to figure out where the meeting is going as you're having the meeting. Something else that we do is uh, we want to make sure that all of our uh, meetings are time well spent and that our to do's are actionable. So you take notes and then that gets translated into something that actually gets done. And one way that we do that is by relying on uh, this feature that allows you to convert existing block types into pages. And so here you can see that we talked about what bugs we wanted to prioritize this week. These bullet points are really easily converted into pages within the task database that Slim just highlighted. And that way, even though you were just taking quick notes at the time, uh, afterwards, you can ensure that this is going to get done because now it's been converted into a page in the task database where it will be assigned uh, to an engineer uh, so that this task you know, has a directly responsible individual and someone is held accountable for finishing it. So speaking of different connections between all of our top level uh, databases, what we're going to be talking about next is how we apply all of these concepts and top level DBs uh, to actually drive a project. So it does no good to have shared global concepts across teams if all of the information, <coughs> excuse me, um, if all of the information is siloed and there are no relationships between them. Um, fortunately, as many of you know, Notion has a relation feature that allows you to create bi directional links between databases and show you what concepts from one database are associated with another database. So this is really useful because if you think about it, a given project at Notion has corresponding customer feedback posts and conversations. There are docs that are related to that particular project. There are tasks that are happening as a result of the work for that project. And there are obviously meeting notes with both internal stakeholders and external stakeholders that influence the development of that process. So, in order to accurately represent and model this information, we keep track of projects and have relations to all of the core databases we talked about above, as well as the feedback database, which Alex will talk about in a moment. So we're gonna walk you through an example, um, specifically pertaining to the Confluence import project, which we shipped in the last quarter last year. And th hopefully this gives you a better idea of how we actually operationalize these relations between databases to make it really easy to see all of the information that's relevant to a particular project at one point in time. So Alex is gonna walk you through the first step of this process, which is feedback collection and prioritization. Yes, so the first step of any project is planning the project based on feedback that you're getting uh, from your users. Uh, and we wanna make sure that we do this in a way that is both comprehensive and actionable. Those two values are really important. We have a huge uh, group of users across a bunch of different personas. You know, We have personal users, team users, really large enterprise companies. We also have users across the world um, in different locations, working on different things. And so because of that, we wanna make sure that our feedback tags uh, can capture all of the different types of feedback that these different user groups are giving us. That's comprehensive. We also wanna make sure that feedback is actionable. So instead of just you know, listening and learning, uh, we actually want to deliver upon this feedback, give the users something that directly addresses um, the conversations that they've had with us. So at Notion, we do this through a process called tagging uh, or feedback tags. Tags describe a function of Notion. So y'all are Notion users. You know that it is uh, a product with a bunch of different functionalities and a bunch of different features. And so uh, to match that, we have a bunch of different tags. And so tags can include requested features. So for example, before we released our timeline view last fall, um, anything that was tagged with DB Gantt timeline was a request uh, for timeline view. Once we release a feature, we preserve the tag because we want to ensure that any incoming feedback about the extant feature is still captured. So for example, we have a dark mode, but anytime people write in about dark mode, we'll tag it with settings dark mode. 
Um, and then finally, we also use tags to keep track of business operations, so not purely product feedback. Um, for example, we have a really awesome startup program uh, in which we provide uh, a discount to startups who are working with our partners. Um, and so we tag all of the questions and uh, forms and inbound inquiries about the startup discount with pricing discount startup. That way we can easily segment all of the users who have reached out um, or are currently in our startup program. So the general schema for how this works is that feedback comes in from users. It goes to our user-facing teams, so customer experience, sales, success. They incorporate it into our tagging system, and then uh, our product and marketing teams review the tags to help them plan their projects, help them create deliverables, and then those things go back to the users and close the loop. Feedback takes a lot of different forms. So we have three major channels here at Notion, in-app chat, email, uh, and Twitter. But we also receive feedback through meetings uh, that our sales team holds, through our Notion ambassador community, as well as, of course, through our own personal network. So in this screenshot in particular, you can see that uh, there's a database in which ambassadors are upvoting features. Um, there's a in-app chat message underneath that. And then on the bottom right, there's a tweet. All of these different sources are referring to recurring tasks, though. And so what our tags allow us to do is standardize and aggregate all of these inbound inquiries uh, into one source of truth. It's our way of turning qualitative user feedback and conversations into quantifiable data that we can compare against other tags. Um, so you can see here that the page recurring tag has had 21 requests in the past week, 100 in the past month, and uh, almost 400 in the past four months. And whenever you hear our team say, uh, we'll add your vote for it, uh, we mean it because we literally uh, are adding a plus one for every single message that we receive about a feature. So to show you what this looks like, we actually created a link database here. Um, we're presenting from our workspace. And so we created a link database directly to our uh, you know, live feedback database uh, to show you a couple of examples of tags for some of our recent projects. So you can see the topmost, most popular tag count here is for performance. This is a project that Slim's team has been working really hard on um, to ensure that Notion is running smoothly and swiftly for all of our users. Underneath that, you can see the tag for Integrate API. Uh, we just released our API in public beta last month, um, which is super exciting. And that's been one of our most requested features uh, for the past couple of years. And then what we're going to focus on today is the import confluence uh, tag and feature. So you can see it's down here. Uh, just wanted to note that Although right now there's only 80 tags, we did release this uh, feature a couple months ago. And so uh, the tag count has decreased dramatically from um, since we released it, uh, obviously since people are no longer requesting it uh, because it's already out. So these numbers, we use our application programming interface or API to import data directly from um, the platforms that our customer experience team uses to uh, communicate with users. So uh, email, uh, in-app chat, and Twitter. And then to create the total feedback count, this is aggregated with all of the other uh, feedback sources. So you can see here within the subpage that um, several things we keep track of for every tag is uh, the category it belongs to, the definition of what the tag means. So in this case, import confluence is a request for confluence import, the project that it's attached to. So this is something that Slim will talk about in just a second. We also link it to the task database. So any tasks related to this tag are here. Um, it directly links to all of the user feedback. Um, so we can't share the different sales meetings um, or direct user conversations. But since Twitter is a public social media platform, uh, we do have this exposed here. So you can see all of the different tweets from the past four months that people have uh, talked about uh, that relate to Confluence import. And then here you have all of these rollups and formulas calculating um, the number of requests we've gotten for this, as well as the total feedback count um, in the past four months. And so the way that our, our uh, product team uses this is they'll look at it and they will uh, use it and use the number counts to help prioritize. But because all of our relations are two-way, this also bookmarks conversations to directly help our product team conduct user research. So they can go into the import confluence tag and directly find the different conversations in which users talked about it. That way they can get the context behind the feature request. Um, and it's a really helpful way uh, to ensure that the user research that's happening is really indicative of what the users want. 
So after the user facing teams review and curate our feedback data, the project lifecycle then shifts towards our design, product, and engineering teammates. Um, and so I'll hand it over to Slim to take you through that. So as Alex was saying, we will prioritize potential projects based on the number of incoming tags and also apply our own qualitative judgment as well. Um, and now I'll share my screen to walk you through what actually this project's workspace and life cycle looks like once we've decided to work on a project. So I've also created a live linked view in our database here, um, or I'm sorry, a live linked database in our workspace here. And it shows you uh, a slice of all of our ongoing future and past work in the projects database. So unfortunately, there are some really exciting new features that I can't quite share right now. So this isn't a complete view of all the projects we're currently working on, but hopefully it gives you an idea of what this database looks like and how we can use views to keep teammates informed at a glance. So you can see here that we have a project will have um, a name field, which just obviously summarizes what that particular project is. There is a status which tracks whether projects are going from uh, the ideation and specification phase to actual development work to whether they're paused or complete, released, follow up, et cetera. Um, there is a directly responsible individual who is the point person for a project and who liaises with other cross functional partners, delivers project status updates, and generally makes sure that work is on track. And then finally, every project typically belongs to some kind of product team. And we have different product teams covering different aspects of the Notion experience. Um, some projects span multiple product teams, for instance, the engineering onboarding working group project here. Um, that's just generally making the onboarding experience for new Notion engineering hires as smooth as possible. And so there's no product team specified for that because it's not, it doesn't belong to a specific work stream. But um, so this is kind of overview at a glance to see what in fact the current projects are. And now I'll take you through what each of these individual project pages looks like. So the first and most important aspect of a project page is the properties, which show key information for each project at a glance, who's responsible, when it's scheduled to ship, related feedback tags, like Alex was saying. And these properties allow us to easily create sorted and filtered views to help different cross-functional partners get their work done. So for instance, the marketing team might be interested in seeing which projects have an upcoming scheduled ship date, or an engineering manager might want to know what are all the projects that my team is currently working on so that I can keep track of overall team progress. And let me actually show you live uh, what this looks like. So for the Confluence import page, you can see here that there is all of the directly responsible individual properties and product teams and status that I talked about earlier. There's also a people property here, which will show you that I was not the only person on this project. My teammate Ryan was also collaborating with me. Um, there's a target ship date, which of course is in the past. Um, and then as Alex was saying, you can see these feedback tags that are associated with it and a formula that allows us to summarize how much volume that this particular feedback tag is getting. So you can see that in the past four months, uh, users have written into us about this import confluence feature four times on personal, 20 times on enterprise, and there have been nine tweets. And this uh, provides really useful information at a glance, which can show you that the Confluence import feature is much more popular among enterprise users. Um, and that overall, this ticket volume is significantly lower compared to how it was before we shipped to this feature in Q4 of last year. So uh, that's not all there is in a project page though. Um, we also have linked views and these linked database views associate each project with the global tasks and docs databases that I was talking about earlier. So these leverage the relations that we described um, and allow us to perform, uh, to create filtered views that just show us the particular tasks and docs that relate to a specific project. So again, I'll show you this live. Um, if you scroll down in our project homepage, there is first a task section and this is a relation that shows all of the current tasks that are in progress for a particular project. Um, obviously, I've moved this around and all of these tasks were completed before, but just to give you a more representative example, um, we've moved them back to show you the different projects uh, statuses. Um, and then in addition, it allows you to see what are all of the docs that are related to this particular project. So as Alex was explaining before, we have lots of different kinds of docs at Notion, including uh, technical requests for comment, as well as internal design docs and announcements. So here you can see that I've written 
several docs um, that relate to this particular project that are useful for posterity for anyone who wants to come back and look through information about this project, if they're handling a support ticket, things like that. Um, and this filtered view allows us to e really easily access this information. And so we do this using the project relation property, um, which says, okay, look at the project uh, relation property and make sure it contains the current status confluence import. And having database templates in the projects database makes it really easy to just spin up a new project and automatically have it populate these views with all of the associated tasks and documents, which makes it really easy to track which information is relevant to each particular project. So once a project is implemented and ready to ship, we're able to then do enter into the uh, marketing and feature follow-up and customer feedback part of the cycle. So now I'll hand it over to Alex to talk through what that looks like and how we actually go through the feature follow-up process. Yeah. So once Slim and um, the product and engineering teams have worked really hard to build and create a feature, uh, we get to do what we love best, which is share it with all of you. Um, so releases are our favorite days. Um, and this is how we kind of go through it. So on a release day, our marketing team will announce the feature um, on our What's New page. So you can see here the screenshot from our What's New page um, of December 2nd, 2020, when we released that Im import confluence feature. Um, and so David Tibbetts, who is our product marketer, puts this together. This is actually created in Notion, which is really cool. Um, but of course, releases are a company-wide effort, um, not just the marketing team. And so our product engineering team and design teams remain on call to respond directly to bug reports and feedback that comes in after a launch. Our customer experience team, which I'm on, trains up beforehand. Um, we write our help center articles and um, we get really familiar with the new feature so that when uh, incoming user questions come in, we are ready to go. And our sales and success teams reach out to their customers um, to inform them of all of these new functionalities. Um, and so it's really cool because we have both an internal database um, tracking all of our releases, as well as this external change log, our What's New page. Um, we can't share the internal database with you today just because it does contain a lot of uh, you know, information about our upcoming projects that we can't surface. Um, but what you can do is you can go to our What's New page and literally go line by line, toggle by toggle to see every single release we've done um, all the way back to 2018, you know, Notion 1.0 and 2.0 days. Um, and what we do with our new Tinos or new Notion teammates um, is have them go through the internal release database. And it's kind of like walking through history of, of where Notion has been and what we've released and where we're going. And finally, to share with you one last thing, um, because we document every single uh, user who has reached out for a particular feature or product, we have tags that track every single conversation. And so we can go back and actually directly follow up with you once a feature has been shipped. Um, so unfortunately, we couldn't find our follow-up for the import confluence feature, um, but we did find some other ones. So this email on the left is actually for another feature that Slim worked on, which is inline equations. Um, and you can see here that um, this was sent directly to Helen from David because she had previously requested this feature. Uh, and now we were following up with her now that it has finally arrived on Notion. The same thing happens um, with other teams. So for example, on Twitter, um, Valerie requested uh, a change to our uh, de-indenting feature um, to basically make it a little bit more intuitive. Once that was shift, shipped, excuse me, I went in and directly responded to the tweet because I was able to find the tag, find all the tweets related to this tag, go in and follow up. Um, and it's just a really heartwarming feeling being able to close the loop completely and kind of give a little bit of a thank you to all of our users um, who are helping us uh, make our product better. Um, once we release, once we follow up, we then go back to the beginning of the feedback loop um, to continue making Notion better alongside all of you. So thank you so much for hanging out with us today to learn how Notion uses Notion. Um, as much as we focus on building these really powerful tools to augment human capability, it's really important to remember that it's exactly that, augmentation, not replacement. And for any given system that organizes information, it's important to think about the human design behind that process. So hopefully you're able to draw some things from this example of how Notion uses Notion and adapt it and mold it to fit your particular workflow um, when designing systems every day. And stay tuned for more insights from later block by block segments. 
And if you do have any questions, um, our teammates will be answering them in Notion Experts Live. Um, so please head over there. And thanks so much for coming out today. Bye. Bye, everyone.